Great. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you all for coming today to learn more about why we need to be talking trash to our students and to the public, because this is really, really a serious issue that's going to be front and center during 2018 and definitely 2019. So you're sort of going to be getting this right um, uh, um, you know, right at a high trend period. And this next slide here is basically going to summarize exactly what's going on in America. So that's the sad message here. Now, 40% of all the food in the United States goes uneaten and ends up in our landfills. So we often walk about the uh, greenhouse gases and one of the worst greenhouse gas is methane. And that's what happens when all of this food just rots in our landfills. When we look at this, you, the United States wastes about 130 billion pounds of food. That's a, that's a equivalent to 100, over 140 trillion calories. We are tossing of good food, yet we have this problem. I mean, the whole essence of this is absolutely crazy. One out of five ch children in the United States goes hungry and we are throwing out good food and filling our landfills. You know, you, you often hear the saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. I think it may be another man's dinner. And this is really a big, big problem. This is so huge that the, the EPA and the USDA got together and they have a goal to reduce food waste by 50% by 2030. And they set up this food recovery hierarchy, which I think is really fabulous. So on the top of it, going from most preferred to least preferred, starting at the top, is source reduction. Let's reduce the volume of surplus food generated. And you say, you're probably saying to yourself, surplus food, what does that mean? I'll get to that in a second. Two, feed the hungry, feed them, give the food to food banks, <laughs> soup kitchens, shelters, feed animals with the scraps, convert the scraps into industrial uses, and of course, then composting, and lastly, then we send it to the landfill, but it has to be less. And this is so funny how the media sets trend. In 2015, this John Oliver at YouTube about food waste garnered over 8 million live and online video views. It's when it comes to the forefront of the media, that's when the public has an understanding. And of course, thank goodness, our fabulous academy had our theme for November, I'm sorry, for, for uh, March, Go Farther with Food for National Nutrition Month, where food waste played a big, big role in those messaging. All right, so it's estimated the total amount of food loss by the United States by food groups. Take a guess, what do you think the top three sources of food waste, what food groups provide it? If you said dairy, vegetables, and fruit, you are 100% correct. So looking at this pie here is dairy foods that are neck and neck with vegetables and fruit um, for the, the biggest contributors to waste. 
Everybody plays a role in this farm to the table continuum. Everybody's got to do their job to reduce food waste in this country and make sure the hungry get fed. So what I want to do is just show you the different uh, uh, routes in getting the food on the table, production, harvesting, processing, dis distribution, and home consumption, and where the losses may occur. So going in production, and if you lo look at this, you say, oh, fruits and vegetables, right there, the biggest culprit in where we are losing, or, uh, what food group is losing, a lot of fruits and vegetables in production. When we get to more of, of harvesting, it, it's more that fruits and vegetables are still leading the pack, but we're not losing a lot at that stage. Let's go to processing. Now, processing, grain seems to be the biggest uh, waste of food. When we get to distribution and retail, and we're talking, you know, getting it to retail and retail is including eating out. Here we go again. Fruits and vegetables are high. Now, watch this. That's where the problem is. It's the consumer. So all along, I am going to show you what is being done in all of these stages of the food continuum. But really, where the culprit is, where the majority is coming from, is the consumer. This is bad news, but in a way, it's good news. Because we as educators can educate our students. We can educate the public on how to reduce this food waste in this stage of the continuum. So again, by breaking it down by food waste categories, you're seeing that once again, households, and if you put it with restaurants, because a lot of the households are bringing things home and then they're wasting the leftovers. So if you look at the two of them together, it is a huge amount of, of the percentage of where food waste is going uh, wrong in this country. All right, so let's look at farms, harvesting, and transportation. The largest category, as you just saw, for uh, uh, food loss at this level is fruits and vegetables. And, and the USDS estimates that about 20% of produce is lost during production. Loss will occur when one, either the food is never harvested or food is lost between harvest and sale. So you, you probably say to yourself, food is never harvested. What, what, why would that occur? Well, that will occur because if the price should drop uh, so dramatically during the growing season where the farmers may leave produce unharvested because it costs more money for them to bring that produce to sale than it was to, to, um, that they're going to get paid for because the price is so low. Harvesting and transportation can contribute to the bruising, damaging of a produce, which makes it unsellable to retailers. And then, of course, Mother Nature can play a part in this. So weather fluctuations. In January 2012, the temperatures in Florida were as low as 18 degrees Fahrenheit, and farmers were scrambling to try to cover their orange crop um, to save it. So it is, you know, so much is going on. Food safety, we're going to talk about in a second, and pests and insects also affect crops. Now, what are the farmers doing? They're doing their job. In fact, you're going to start seeing high tech in a precision agri agri agriculture in farming. They believe that this is scientific viable by 2019 and it's gonna be mainstream by 2020. What are we gonna start seeing? We're gonna start seeing drones flying over the fields and giving information back to the farmer that can tell them that where the weeds are, what the soil nutrient content is, where they have to fertilize. You're gonna start seeing fleets of agrobots, your know, robots that are going to be weeding and picking crops. We already have already smart tractors that have GPS systems via iPads on it, which can go over a field and the farmer can see what the nutrient content is of that soil so he, he or she can just put down exactly what has to happen. And when it comes to weeds, the same, only put down the pesticides needed to minimize the use of that and the, and the, the price that goes along with that. 
We're going to have cows that are texting. You know, they're not going to take pictures and put them on Instagram. But what we're going to do is they are going to be monitored um, uh, by sensors. And the farmer will be able to assess if a cow or an animal gets sick to intervene quickly before they sicken the entire uh, cattle or the, the title, all the animals. Um, and also if, it's, if a, a, a cow should go into labor, they'll be able to see that. And lastly, there is going to be a collection of farm data that's going to be cloud-based. So all of this can be uh, uh, followed by the USDA and shared among farmers. So again, the farmers are really doing their job, but sometimes things go wrong. So let's see what happened when things go wrong. news here tonight. The government has just lifted the warning and had people all over the country afraid to eat red tomatoes. Salmonella, at first thought to be linked to tomatoes, made more than 1,200 people sick in 42 states since April, the largest salmonella outbreak ever. But now the FDA says there are no longer any suspect tomatoes in the fields or heading to markets. But the cause of the outbreak, well, it's still a mystery. And a warning remains for some varieties of peppers. Kelly Kobiea has the latest. The producers of summer's most popular produce finally got a break today with no hint as to what might have caused the largest food court outbreak in decades. The Food and Drug Administration said it's okay to put tomatoes back on the menu. As of today, FDA officials believe that consumers may now enjoy all types of fresh tomatoes available on the domestic market. The FDA did not clear tomatoes as a possible source of the outbreak. Food safety investigators simply said that any tomatoes that might have been tainted with salmonella are off store shelves by now. People have been getting sick with the same strain of salmonella since late April, though the CDC says the numbers of reported illnesses are starting to drop off from a peak of nearly 50 in one day in late May. No one has come forward with salmonella St. Paul since July 4th. The outbreak has dealt a serious blow to the tomato industry. Growers put their losses at $100 million, and sales are down as much as 40%. And now, peppers. The FDA says people who became ill in the last few weeks were more likely to have eaten jalapenos or serranos, not tomatoes. So the warnings still stand then for jalapeno and serrano peppers, and the FDA is now sending investigators down to a processing plant in Mexico, which takes in peppers from a number of different farms. And Kelly. All right, so that was in 2008, and I'm sure a lot of us remember this. But this is when they, the in, in June, early June, when the USDA stepped in and to give this warning, uh, um, and then they figured out it was actually the, the peppers. But what happened is when they removed the warning in uh, July 17, 2008, the, the consumer was so afraid of eating tomatoes that they didn't do it. So all of this tomato uh, acreage went unharvest and didn't go to market. And that's where we had tremendous food waste, where it becomes this all got wasted. No one was able to eat it. People lost a lot of money and people didn't get that food. So we know that the farmer is doing his and her job. Sometimes Mother Nature steps in and, and, and makes it challenging, but they are really doing their best to reduce food waste. Process and packaging. Food waste occurs during cleaning, grinding, packaging, cooking, and cutting. And manufacturers and food waste is estimated about 7 billion pounds of food waste is generated at this stage of the continuum. And but we're there doing a better job. Right now, about 106 million pounds is being donated to those, those pantries uh, and those shelters that need the food. And a lot of it now is being recycled. So what this they are doing at this level, they're recycling it to animal feed, making it for fertilizer, composing, or biofuel. So again, the processor is trying hard to implement these kind of food waste um, uh, uh, strategies. All right, here's a problem. This is a consumer problem and we have to do something about this. There's a process called culling at this stage, and that's when processes will cull crops for appearance, size, color, weight, and blemishes. 
And it's estimated that culling removes up to about 40% of the produce before it even reaches the retail sector. Now, we've all seen this. We've all seen this on social media. We've all seen this on television. We've seen this movement in magazines, and it's a great movement. Great movement. All bodies are beautiful. Stop body shaming. And when I saw this, I said, a light bulb went off in my head. We got to get the hashtag off. Stop produce shaming. And what we have to do is to teach the public that produce just like this, that may be just off in shape, is still delicious. It's still the same produce inside and out. I mean, that's two carrots for the price of one, but the public won't buy that. That lemon is perfectly fine. That pear is fabulous, but the public wants perfect. So what we have to teach the public that these are nutritious, they may be actually reduced in price, which will save it on a while, their wallet, and get them to eat this rather than being put to the dumps. And we have to do this, and this is where, as educators, we can do this. We can turn this around. What we have to tell consumers is that perfect tomatoes make a perfect salad. But not so perfect tomatoes make a perfect salsa. And that's what we have to get the consumer to do to teach those messages to be coming home and how to use this kind of vegetables and produce. Interesting story. Baby carrots are real big carrots. We all know that as educators, but they weren't this way. And this came out in about 1986 by a man who had a carrot company. And he was frustrated about all his quote unquote carrots that didn't look perfect. So what he did is he took those unperfect, uh, not perfect uh, carrots and he whittled them down to these baby carrots. He revised the carrot industry because he became the call the carrot savior because he got a secondary market for these carrots that were not perfect. He brought them to supermarkets, they sold out and boom, we have now a baby carrot market that we know is totally, totally huge. That's a great example of how changing it. So what's happening is there are people that are coming in and saying, you know, there's too much food waste and we can make do better. And this is an unbelievable system that's going on. So let's watch this. Food waste is one of the most easily solvable problems, literally the low-hanging fruit of environmentalism. Part of the planet, my job took about 20% of all produce never makes it off the farm. It's just like a little funny, it's a little weird, but when you cut into it, it's perfectly good. It's just a total shame. It's totally good stuff. We buy ugly produce and then we eat it. Yeah, we eat ugly produce. So for all the lucky people that live in Cal uh, Ca uh, California, Seattle, even in the Chicago area, this is now um, moving out there where you can go onto their website and you can have this delivered to your house. And they're, they're, they are moving it uh, towards the East Coast. So you just need to check back to them to see when it's available in your area. 
this fabulous company, Bon Appetit, what they're doing is the same thing as the other company, but what they are doing is taking the food and going right to restaurants. So they are bypassing the consumer and taking it to reduce food waste and, and rescuing it and taking it to restaurants that can use it. So we have trends and everything everything um, drives trends. And as we all know, is we're seeing a meat craze, a protein craze, and we're looking at that, that is the new all time snack craze now is meat. So what are companies doing? Companies are going together to go after that meat craze and they are taking protein scraps in their laboratory, and they're capitalizing on the hot food topic, food waste. They are partnering with, with, with spent grains and brews and uh, vegetable pulp from juicers, and they are going to have a protein snack. So you see that even companies are saying, gee, what can I get out? What can I do with the scraps of the chicken that I um, am not doing to repackage it? So they are getting into the game. Retail stores are in the game. We know that that the cause of retail stores was that, you know, ugly fruit that we saw, excessive package sizes, people buy the big chickens and they don't eat it, damaged food or unpopular seasonal items. And it's estimated that from fruits and vegetables alone, 15 billion is lost in supermarkets. You know, this is really funny. This was actually a picture that I took of my supermarket and I was shopping on a Saturday and I was like, I had like one of those gotcha moments where I said, ha ha, they're going to throw all this produce off. They, the guy was cleaning it and putting it in his bin. So I went up to him and I said, where are you going with all that produce? And he says, we're donating it to a pig farm. And, you know, I said, boy, that's a pretty nice looking pig because that's awfully nice produce. But you see, even supermarkets are, are, are understanding this and not just tossing it in landfill, but recycling it among our animals. Now, what we have to do is convince the public how to shop. If you look at this, this is a picture of, in the supermarket. And when you look at these empty shelves, what happens, that gives a negative picture to the consumer. And rather than wanting to buy this produce, they think something's wrong with it. They think it's the leftovers. They think that's the only thing left, so therefore it's negative and it's not good, good, uh, good produce. We as educators have got to change this perception among the public. Look what happens. This is so interesting. Okay, any online shoppers here? Go online. You go shopping, you see only three in stock. You will be knocking people over to get your American Express to buy this scarf because there's only three left. Yet when you see produce in the produce store, they don't want it. So again, it's a marketing perception that we have to fix among the public. My favorite color used to be red, but my favorite color is yellow. Because whenever I'm in TJ Maxx, my favorite store, and I shop, I love yellow. I actually hyperventilate when I see yellow on these tags because of the reduced um, uh, value that I'm getting. So we need to teach people the bargain hunt in the supermarket. We need to teach them that when they see yellow on food, it's still safe to eat. The quality is still there, and it's at rock garden prices. We have to teach them that reduced sales doesn't mean it's reduced quality, reduced nutrition, but rather use it up. And we have to get them to do that. Supermarkets are doing a phenomenal job of trying to recycle food waste. Walmart um, used to throw out an estimated one in every 10 dozen eggs, uh, so the equivalent of about five billion eggs per year. That's enough eggs to make an omelet that could be the size of Manhattan. <laughs> so what they're doing now is if an egg is cracked, historically, if an egg was cracked in a carton, they would throw the whole carton out. Now they're not doing that. Now what they're doing is they're throwing the egg out and then they are making a substitution that it needs the, of the name of the same egg specification. So from, a, from another broken cart and they're saving gazillion eggs. And this is what 
uh, food companies and uh, and rest, I'm sorry and supermarkets are doing. The food industry is also doing research to uh, to um, have technologies that expand and the shelf life of produce. And we um, most of us all know about this, mo and this map with the modified atmosphere packaging, which substitutes the atmosphere inside a package with a, a protective gas that helps keep um, the shelf life longer for these kinds of foods. So we need this kind of innovation to keep our foods safe and, and shelf stable for longer. Grocery stores do generate a lot of food waste, but they are doing their job. They're, they're donating it to shelters. They're donated to the pigs in the animal field, composting and going to fuel. So again, the supermarket is doing their job. Restaurants, food service operations, billions of pounds have estimated to be lost in food service operations. And interestingly, food waste generated by universities is unbelievable. Now, if you look at this tray, I, know, I can tell you that many universities, I can tell you here at Boston University, trays are no longer allowed in the cafeteria because it's been shown that if you take the tray away from the college student, they will cut food waste by about 20 to 30 percent. Why? Because they load up this thing, their eyes are bigger than their stomachs, as my Italian grandmother would say, and they load it up and throw it away. Now they have to get up for seconds if they want this. And this has decreased dramatically the food waste at Boston University, and I'm sure if your university is using it, you have seen the same um, um, you know, profit. Chefs are not throwing things away. The stalks from the broccoli are going in the soups. Smoothies are going in vegetables that don't look good or fruits are going into smoothies. So again, everybody is playing their part in reducing food waste. Messaging also at this level is fabulous. And they know that messaging to the students will help them think twice about going back for seconds or throwing away food that they don't want. So food waste is a problem, more so for 54% of small businesses, restaurants are having a problem with this because it's hard for them to donate the food. There's barriers to do that. Barriers to you know get it out to the consumer, barriers about recycling and transporting it. So while they're tracking what their food waste is, they're trying to donate it and recycle it, they are having a bigger problem dealing with food waste. Now, this is again where we have to go. We have to say, okay, when you go out to the restaurant, do you really need those big portions? And only half of Americans take leftovers home from restaurants. And we have to teach the public to do that. We'll take it home and, of course, to eat it. We have to do that rather than leaving it on the place that generates the food waste, that generates the food waste for the restaurants. Restaurants are stepping up. This is um, a restaurant in Washington, D.C. called Modern Markets. It is, it's also in Colorado for those that are maybe um, uh, from are on that neck of the woods here. And they are now putting on their menus to have half portions of everything, even the soups. So again, educating the consumer, if you're not going to bring it home, get half of the portion on this. It'll save you money. It'll save you food waste. We have to teach them a doggy bag, but don't get it lost like the strawberries that were in the first clip that we showed in, in the video, in the back of the refrigerator you know, for, for weeks on end to the point where it has to be tossed. There is now an app called Food for All. This is so exciting. They partner with restaurants and what they'll do is partner with them. And at the end of the night, they will sell the food for a very inexpensive uh, cost. So uh, an hour before closing, they'll go to the app, the restaurant will tell the app that they have hamburgers or something, and then from 10.30 p.m. to 11, they're gonna sell them for only $4 versus probably three, four times that amount on the menu. The consumer can um, get online, look for these sales, and go in and get it, 
take it home with education, how to properly freeze it or, or, or refrigerate it, have it for a meal at a very, very low cost. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen, this is the problem, the consumer, wasting up to 50% more food today than they did in the 1970s. And, you know, I can remember that every Sunday, my family would sit down, big Italian family would sit down to a big chicken dinner. And, you know, we had that chicken Sunday for dinner. The leftover chicken had chicken sandwiches the next day for lunch. The little giblet things made chicken salad. And then that carcass made chicken soup. I mean, that right. chicken kept on giving and giving. And people don't do that anymore. And we have to get the public into more cooking. We throw away more food in developed countries um, that, and, than, than all uh, uh, other. And it's, again, it's a food waste. And people don't understand what to do it or understand that it's still good to eat. You might recall this visual. This is from the latest 2015-2020 uh, dietary guidelines. And if you remember going back, a lot of the subject matter for the guideline was on obesity and really how to you know, monitor your, your calories and to get Americans to get a better control of their weight. So how do to eat more healthily and appropriately within the calorie, calorie limit at home, school, work site, communities, or retail. And when you think about it, waste management is really waste management because obesity is food waste because we're overeating calories more than we need and becoming obese to the point where it's affecting our health. So waste management is sort of on the lines of goes in hand in hand with obesity. The American family throws away an average of almost $1,500 worth of edible food a year. That is the equivalent of going into a supermarket, buying five bags of groceries and throwing two of them in the parking lot and driving away. I mean, that's unbelievable. For your students, if you want to convert that into information that they can identify that with, that $1,500 is the amount of money that would buy about 350 lattes. So again, we're wasting our money, we're wasting our food, and we're trashing it. This is a phenomenal study that was done on household waste. And what they, I can't move this, oh, I can pull this over. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. What they found out that majority of Americans feel bad about food waste. If you go to the first one, they feel guilty when throwing away food. So the red is strongly agree and the, uh, and the gray is agree somewhat. So about 77% feel bad about it. About 70% here feel that throwing away food if the package date has been passed reduces the chances someone will get sick. So that makes them nervous. That's why they throw it away. Some food waste is necessary to make sure that meals taste good. About 60% said that. They're worried about that. Throwing food waste is bad for the environment. They understand that. Food waste, oh, food, waste more food when packaged, foods are, born, uh, are packaged in large quantities. They agree. It's difficult to reduce food waste farther. They totally agree about that. And we'll talk about that why in a second. Throwing away food is a major source of wasted money. They get that. Don't have time to worry about the food waste. That's what they're complaining about. And your food house, your household wastes more food than other households of your side. Oh, no, 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 no. Not my house. It's my neighbor's house. So what they did in these researchers did, it was really fascinating. They took what they found in the study and they categorized it under three categories. Practical benefits of food waste, food waste guilt, food waste reduction potential. So if what they did is they grouped it together. So the practical time, time practical benefits of food waste as, as seen by the consumer is, I don't have time to worry about food waste. That's it. Food waste ensures quality. I'm protecting my family. Food waste reduces foodborne illness. 
Okay, so that was the practice. That's why they do it. That's when they validate. Yet, on the other side, they do feel guilty about food waste, and they understand it's bad for the environment, and they understand it's a waste of money. And the potential to change, well, I don't believe that they waste food more than other households, and, and they don't, but they don't believe that it's hard to do, but they're really not sure if they want to do it, and then they do know that bulk food wastes more. So how can you get to your students <coughs> and to the consumer using these sound bites, using these strategies or concerns that they have and flipping them to help them reduce food waste. Okay, first thing, 90% of Americans toss premature food or food that's prematurely tossed because they misinterpret the food labels. We know this. We know this. They don't know whether they should throw it, eat it, or when to do it. And they're nervous, as we saw, about getting their family sick and foodborne illness. They're going, when in doubt, toss it out. And how many times have we used that before when it comes to foodborne illness? But the only product that legally requires the expiration of date is infant formula. And we have to educate the consumer about the sell by date, the best used by date, and the used by date. We have to explain this, that this is all about a food quality issue, not a food safety issue. And we have to make them feel comfortable that they can refreeze it for another time. Mm -hmm. You're going to have some help. Starting in June 2018, the USDA has suggested to manufacturers to get rid of the sell-by date. There will only be two dates on the label, best if used by and used by. And the used by will be for food safety. And, and, and so the consumer will understand this. The Grocery uh, Marketing Association and the Food Market Institute is on board. They collaboratively want to do this because they don't want the grocery stores to have all this food ace. So thankfully, this is going to be changing. Now, what do we educate them? There are phenomenal apps that the consumer can use to decide, should I keep it or toss it? And this is something called Still Tasty. This is a fabulous app. So you can, you can click on whatever food category. Let's click, click on dairy. And what will come up in dairy, you can list the food that you want to know more about. This is milk, pasteurized milk. And it will tell you it lasts five to seven days after the sell-by date. And you can freeze for three to four months. This is a phenomenal resource tool that the consumer can use to help them figure out, should I keep it or I toss it? We have to teach our consumers to get organized. We have to get them to organize their refrigerator, take, understand what's in there, take an inventory before they go food shopping so they don't overbuy. We need to make them clean up and organize their, their refrigerators like their closets. It's almost like the California closet model here. We need to have them plan in advance. Yet then use the, the, the supermarket circuit like a GPS. You can get that online. We got to teach them how to use their freezers for more than ice cubes. To buy, if they buy in bulk quantities, to package it up and freeze it for another day. Because we know that the large packages are, are more course of benefit, but let's use the freezer. And we have to teach them how to do this. We have to teach one to leftovers are like buy one, get one free. Okay, so we said that, gee, they have no time to do food waste. They have no time to worry about food waste. Well, guess what? You have no time to cook. So what are you throwing away good food, but rather package it up and have a leftovers day where you don't have to cook, which will save you time in the kitchen. So again, we have to spin these messages that are going to work for what's keeping them um, um, from preventing them from reducing food waste. This is SaveTheFood.com. This is a phenomenal resource by the National Resources Defense Council. And their goal is to um, generate and reduce food waste. And if you go to this website, it gives you tips, 
to do it, how to cook, store, share it, live with it. They'll even have a guesstimator, which I think is fabulous, where you put in how many people are coming to your meal, children, average eater, big eaters, you put in and it'll tell you how much chicken to buy, how much carrots to buy, and so on. It's really phenomenal. They will tell you how to freeze things. They will tell you how to revive food. That droopy celery that's in the produce bin, will, they'll give you tips to how to revive it. You got brown bananas, you click on the brown bananas, they will give you a recipe to use the brown bananas. The same thing with the pears. That carrots don't look so good, they'll give you a recipe for carrot soup. So again, we have to get these resources out to the consumer to help them help themselves. We got to get them into the habit of donating leftovers to the local pantry. This is another excellent app by ampleharvest.org. You put in your zip code and it'll tell you where your nearest pantry is to donate food. This is really good, especially if you're gonna be going on vacation and you wanna clear out your refrigerator. So with that summary, I, I am um, I'm hoping that together we can really reduce this issue with food waste. Again, 40% of Americans, 40% of the food that Americans have is being wasted. We have people that are hungry. And yet while everybody pays and plays a part in this food waste issue, many other parts of the continuum are already doing it. Who isn't doing it is the consumer. And we really have to help them reduce food waste and get them to get more affordable and better meals um, on their table. So with that, I want to thank you so, so much for listening. And uh, Mary, um, I'm going to pull it over to you.